coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. But why didn't Jesus give in to the lies, the temptations, and the accusations of Satan? Why? Here's why. Because he always pleased the Father. It's not about taking on Satan. He's already been taken on, whipped, defeated, and stripped. He's done. He's, all, he's toast. It's about pleasing the Father now. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Put Satan in your rearview mirror. He always pleased the Father. Since God was with him, Jesus walked in, in the power of the Spirit. Wherever he went and whatever he did, he walked in that power and that authority. And people, whether they hated him or loved him, they had to respect that authority that was on him. When Joshua came into power and Moses was dead and God says, uh, Moses, uh, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now I'm going to give you this, this promised land along with my people. And I I tell you today, do not look to the left or to the right. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes in, the, in my word and keep my word. And I tell you today, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Welcome to Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery. Today we're bringing you a new word. It is entitled, Exchanging Volatility for Stability. This is a right now word for the body of Christ. It helps us through the word of God to understand what is going on spiritually and how that is working out in the natural. Get out the Bible, go with me, and let's hear this powerful word straight from God. In Hebrews 1, the writer of Hebrews says that God upholds all things by the word of his power. He speaks it, and it exists. And then after it exists, his word has the power to keep it. I want you to think about the planets and how they're all spinning in, in, up in uh, the universe. We're on a big old ball in the middle of nowhere, and it's sitting here. And nothing removes it. It doesn't fall out of space. It's amazing, isn't it? It's because God upholds all things with the word of his power. And the Lord has given me some serious wisdom to share with you all today. And I want to invite you to hear what the Spirit is saying by opening up your hearts and let's get God's Word hidden in our hearts so that we do not sin against it. Will you do that? Look there in Matthew chapter 7. Let's pick it up in verse 24. Jesus is speaking. He says, Therefore, whoever, say whoever, whoever. does what? Hears. hears these sayings of mine and ignores them. That's not what it says, is it? Whoever hears these things of mine and does them, practices them, implements them in their life, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So if you're keeping God's word, if you don't have the motivation to apply yourself to God's word, to get in it and read it, and you call yourself a Christian, and you don't uh, have the motivation to live out God's Word, hear what the Spirit is saying today, if you will do God's Word and live it out and practice it in your everyday life, God will li liken you unto a wise person who has built their house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. It sounds like 2020. And it did not fall. Why didn't it fall? for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, look what happens, I will, it, uh, will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, and here's why. For he taught them as one having 
authority, not as the scribes. There was something different about Jesus. When Jesus spoke, it brought about a place of authority in the atmosphere. And people sensed the authority on Jesus' life and says, wait a minute, something is different about this rabbi, this teacher, than about all those other rabbis and all those other teachers. When he speaks, there's authority behind what he is saying. And when you speak with authority, it's not that, oh, I feel some goosebumps, I feel the presence of God. It is that hell is hearing the word of God go forth and is shaking the gates of hell and is breaking the chains off of those that are bound and oppressed and sick and broken. And when the word goes forth, it breaks the strongholds of the enemy off of people so that they can go free. If you want to hear the word of God, hear it with authority. And if you want to have authority, live out this word. This is not about religion. It's about being in relationship with a God that is a covenant-keeping God. And performs his word. He, matter of fact, he watches over his word to perform it, does he not? The powers and the works of Satan aren't effective in a family, a nation, a society. The powers and the works of Satan are not effective in a church fellowship where God's word and God's will are kept by the people. No weapon formed. That means Satan's powers, his schemes, his works, his lies, his tricks are ineffective. They fall powerless to the ground when the people in that family, in that nation, in that society, in that church fellowship trust in God and obey his will and his word. When the storm comes, the house is going to stand. Look at all this church has gone through in 2020 and how hard the enemy is still hitting this body. But this body is still standing because this body has shown Satan and hell and the world that this body is standing on the rock, Christ Jesus, and there's nothing else that can keep a body intact, a family intact, or a family intact except building your lives on this word. The storms will, listen, the storms will reveal what you're building your life on. Nevertheless, even believers can give themselves over to the enemy to cause volatility to come into their lives. We as believers can give ourselves over to the enemy. Hear what the Spirit is saying, y'all. And when we give ourselves over to the enemy, we don't realize we're doing it, but it can happen and can cause volatility to come into our lives. Instability. Unrest. Do you want to live in a sense of volatility or live in stability? Stability is where we need to be, is it not? The devil is working overtime through people who are disobedient to God's will and God's word. And because of this, it allows our nation to become unstable. But it doesn't have to be. I want you to look that everything that God has up under his auspices, up under his control, up under his authority is stable. His church is stable. His earth is stable. The heaven that he dwells in is stable. His, his throne is stable. His kingdom is stable. But everything that Satan gets his little paws on is volatile. There's always that question, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen in the election? What's going to happen in America? What's going to happen in the economy? What's going to happen here? And what's going to happen there? Instability. And what is causing and creating this instability? And how can we get a grip on it so that we don't allow that instability to get inside of us? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 7, after they had eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it says, then the eyes of both of them were open. Well, we know that's the eyes of their understanding because they already saw the fruit, and they knew 
They were conscious that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from what? The presence of the Lord. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you have given to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were not alone. Think about that. When they sinned, they were not alone. God's presence was with them. However, after they sinned, something transpired in their hearts and consciences that caused them to become self-conscious. In the context of these verses, it seems as though God's presence didn't manifest until after they had sinned. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, and they hid themselves from the presence of God. It's as though God's presence just showed up after the fact. But doesn't the Bible teach us that God is omnipresent, meaning God's presence is everywhere? Doesn't the Bible teach us that? Look there in Psalm 139, verse 7. David is writing this psalm. He says in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, God, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. So if you're hiding stuff in your life, and you think because you're keeping it secret, keeping it in the dark, nobody's going to see it. God says the darkness is the same as light to me. He has night vision. And so David is saying here, where can I go from your presence? This is scriptural proof that God's presence was with Adam and Eve while they were sinning. But why does it seem like it wasn't? The Lord told me that even though Adam and Eve weren't alone in the garden with the serpent, they chose to act alone. Whoa. That puts full responsibility on Adam and Eve for their actions and decisions. They, God says they weren't alone. I was with them. But they acted alone. And when we do like... David did with Bathsheba or Samson with Delilah and we do something that's outside God's will then we're acting alone we're acting as though God does not exist they made the fatal mistake of grieving the presence of God that they might fulfill a carnal desire that was burning in their hearts they grieve the presence of God, y'all. Americans, in their sin, are grieving the presence of God. After Adam and Eve both quenched God's spirit and his presence by giving in to lust, the presence of God lifted from them, and they became self-conscious. So if we can get out of self and get back into God's presence then it'll change the way we think. It'll change the way we see ourselves, and the way you see yourself will, de will determine how you speak out your mouth and how you act.
As Christians, we have to get back into the place that God created man, both male and female, before the fall. We have to press into God's Word, press into His presence, and that's exactly what God has had us to do in this year, throughout the year, is press into Him. When the storms got rough, we pressed harder into Him. When hurt and pain came at us like tidal waves, we pressed into Him, and we kept pressing into Him, and we're continuing to press into Him until we become God conscious instead of living our lives being more self-conscious. What we've got to do is, right now in this year, what the Spirit is saying to the body of Christ is to press into God. If fear is gripping your heart and you're worried and anxiety is just off the map in your heart and you don't know what, what to do and you're wringing your hands, God says, press into me. And when you press into me, my presence will come upon you. He will keep those in perfect peace whose minds stay upon him. That's his word. What the Lord is about to say to us is vitally important for the times that we're going through currently. Until believers become personally captivated by the presence and the nearness of God's Spirit, they may have the tendency to feel alone when they encounter spiritual attacks. Get that in your spirit. We have to become personally captivated by God's presence and His nearness by pressing into Him when these storms come. You remember when David and his men were fighting the Philistines and they came back from battle and they came to Ziklag and they came there and they found that Ziklag was burned and their families and their belongings were gone, and they didn't know what had happened. What did David do? Did he do like his men and pick up stones ready to kill somebody over what somebody else had done? Or did he humble himself and put on the ephod to go into God's presence, to press into God's presence? And he, it says in the Bible that David got down and he encouraged himself and the Lord, and he sought the Lord, says, Lord, can we pursue and can we overtake? And God says, because you have pressed into me in a time of battle, in a time of war, and you didn't let what happened happened to you that was wrong, get you all tied up and offended and bitter. You, you pressed into me and you sought me. Not only will you pursue, not only will you overtake, but without, you, without fail you shall recover all. And they went and they found their, their children and their wives and they were well. And God says, I know where they're at and I'll take you to them and you will bring them back. And I am the God of restoration. If you'll get this in your spirit, God is saying, draw near to me. I am near to those that are broken and contrite and I will be with you and I will show you the way through and I will bring restoration back upon you and your family's life. But whatever you do right now, don't make the, the fatal mistake of thinking because of what we're going through that God's presence has abandoned us or abandoned America. That is a lie from hell. God's presence is right here. God's presence is in Washington. In DC, God's presence in New York, God's presence is in California, and God's presence is in Georgia. Where can we go from God's presence? What we've got to do is get out of this self conscious mode that Adam and Eve got us into. It's not that we're alone when the adversary attacks us. It just simply means that Satan has captured our heart's attention. And we have taken our attention off the Lord momentarily and our, gotten our eyes on the temporal. When this happened to Adam and Eve, they fell. They took their eyes off of God, what he had said, God's will, and they fell. When Simon took his eyes off Jesus, he began to drown. Have you noticed when people in the Bible took their eyes off the Lord, they went down? Jonah took his eyes off the Lord, wanted to get out of God's presence, and he kept going down till he went all the way down to Sheol or hell. When Samson focused on Delilah, the presence of God lifted off of him, and he became weak like any other man. 
See, where is our focus right now, y'all? Where's the focus for the body of Christ right now? Well, ministers just aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Your eyes are on, on man. It, work out your own salvation. If there's not a shepherd to shepherd you, work out your own salvation. Get in God's presence and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. But we've got to press into God's presence, and God's presence will come upon us and overtake us, and we will be like Jesus. We will have authority that the scribes and the Pharisees do not walk in because God is with us and God is for us. But when Samson sinned, it says God's spirit left him, and he didn't realize it. And he lost his strength, and he became weak, weak like any other man. That tells us something. When the church gets its eyes on Delilah, the spirit of Babylon, and goes after filthy lucre, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and forsake this, they're walking out from under their spiritual covering, and they're forfeiting their authority. And Satan will pick up on that and go after us like a dog with a, a bone. But there's hope. Look in Ephesians chapter 6, please. It's just hitting close to where you live. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you... Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And bond servants, boy, he's hitting us all, isn't he? Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear, with fear, and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing good, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, not man. You'll receive it from God when you do it as unto the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Boy, that's a good scripture for racism. Masters, give up your threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. You, you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're not a slave of God. There's no slaves and masters in God's kingdom. I'm no longer a slave I'm a son, and you are a daughter of God because there's no partiality. I feel the anointing on that. God is speaking to somebody right now. We get our identity not from the color of our flesh, but we get our identity from Christ and Christ alone because in him there is no partiality. And then he says, finally, my brethren, here it comes, y'all. Be strong in the Lord and walk in the power of his might. And how do we do that? By putting on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Spiritual authority comes from being spiritually submitted to God in all things. That's why I read most of that chapter. The first part of it is talking about submission. And once we learn how to do spiritual submission, doing things for people as unto the Lord, and God will reward us for those things, then we're operating in spiritual authority. Jesus spoke as one having authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. So if you don't want to feel alone, don't act alone. Whoo, that and burnt. <laughs> If you don't want to feel alone, don't act alone. 
You will notice in these verses, as we do what we're required by the Lord to do as His children, as employees, as children of our parents, and as Christians, we're also instructed to do them as unto the Lord. And people, Christians, good-hearted, sincere, ignorant Christians in the workplace will get all messed up because they got this manager, this boss over them, and all they see is how bad that, that boss is, and they talk about them behind their back to other employees and spread discord among them, and they don't even realize because they're ignorant of, of uh, Ephesians chapter 6, they don't realize you're doing this not just before man in secret. God is hearing your words. He sees how you're sowing discord among the, the, the members of the family, how you're sowing discord among the employees of the, the business that is paying your salary. You're sowing discord among the members of the body of Christ that Jesus gave his last blood for. And God sees that and God is not pleased with that. But if you'll press in and say, you know what? I'm on this job. I may be doing my 40, but I'm doing it for God. Amen. Take your, your vent to him. Because if you'll pray for your manager, God just might change you. <laughs> Slipped that in there, didn't I? <laughs> when we do all that we do as unto the Lord, this is key, or another catchphrase that has become popular in 2020, it is essential. So that the enemy cannot deceive us into thinking that we are in this dangerous world alone. When we do everything that we do as unto the Lord, then this is key so the enemy cannot deceive us into thinking, hey, we're in this, this world alone. We're almost out of time, and I hate to cut it short, but be sure and tune in next week for the conclusion of this message. There is so much more in store, and you do not want to miss it. Mark the station and the time that you're watching on. Set yourself a reminder. That's how powerful and relevant this message is to the body of Christ for the hour that we're living in. God is preparing us, equipping us, so that we will not have that feeling as though God has abandoned us. He is with us, He is for us, and He is powerful and mighty to save according to the Word of God. So be strong in your faith and look to the heavens because God is sitting on His throne and He's fighting for your victory. As I get ready to leave you today, I want to encourage you, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, would you email those in at prayer at whcnorth.org or you can call the church office. The information will be at the bottom of the screen. Let us know how we can agree with you, and we do that. Myself and the intercessors pray over the prayer request. We've seen God move mountains, change lives, change physical situations because He hears the prayers of the righteous, and the righteous, the prayers avail much. As always, I want to give you opportunity also if you've been watching Keys to Kingdom Living and you would like to sow into this ministry, visit our website, whcnorth.org. There you'll be able to navigate to the tabs of PayPal and Givelify. You can give safely and securely, and all funds go straight back into the television ministry to allow us to do what God has called us to do. That's to teach the Word of God to the nations. And we're so grateful to Him for this opportunity. I'm grateful to you for watching today. I pray God's richest blessings upon you and your family this week.